ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد so just to announce uh, inshallah uh, next thursday so not two days from now inshallah nine days from now we're going to restart the wednesday aqeedah lessons uh, uh, inshallah the next series is going to be um, uh, commentary on uh, Thursday. Yeah. You said Wednesday. So not or Thursday. So nine days from today, uh, inshallah, it'll be a, a commentary on the small risala by Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab called uh, uh, Nawaqid al Islam, and it'll probably take between four and six lessons. So it'll be quite quick, um, and it's about the things that would remove someone from Islam, and uh, just a commentary on that. Um, so to continue with where we left off last week. The last thing that we began speaking about was um, if there's something on the skin of a person when they're performing wudu, uh, whether they ha- whether it has to be removed or not, um, and how or what's the amount that would need to be removed or and that type of thing. So, the last thing that we said was anything that uh, restricts the water touching the skin would need to be removed, and we gave examples of that: uh, makeup for women, um, paint. Uh, any sort of dirt or oil that's sta- that's standing in the way of uh, the water reaching the person's uh, skin, um, and there's just a few other points to add to this. So the next point that relates to this is the issue of um, if someone has uh, dirt or some sort of substance under their nails. Um, uh, so particularly for those who work in uh, in jobs where that are labor intensive and those types of things, it's often that they'll have something under their under their nails. So what's the ruling on having to remove this? Does the person have to remove these things before uh, they uh, perform wudu in order for it to be valid, or or do we is it excused, or what's what's the ruling with related or related to that? So uh, the, there's this uh, falls in, into three different opinions. The first is that it has to be removed, regardless of how much it is, and regardless of the difficulty in uh, removing it. So if someone had dirt under their nails, they would have to remove it, and they would have to take the effort to do so. Um, and this is the opinion of uh, some of the Shafi'iyah and the Hanabila, and particularly the scholar and mutawalli from the Shafi'iyah, um, and Ibn Aqil from the Hanabila. Uh, the evidence that they use is they say that uh, this is an area that water should be touching, so if something's in the way of it, then it needs to be removed. And they, they just leave it at that, just like we talked about last week. And then they also use a weak hadith for this, um, which uh, it's weak, plus it also doesn't really prove the point, but in any case, they use it anyway. So it's a hadith um, from Abu, Abu Ayyub al-Azdi, that he said, أَتَى رَجُلٌ النَّبِيَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ يَسْأَلُهُ فَقَالْ يَسْأَلَنِي أَحَدُكُمْ عن خبر السماء ويدعو أظافره كأظاف كأظفار الطير يجتمع فيها الجنابة والتفث. or they mention that uh, the Prophet ﷺ a man came to him and uh, asked him a question. so the Prophet ﷺ said, um, people or someone comes to me asking me about the news that comes from the heavens and he has nails or he le- he's left his nails. Like the talons of a bird, in underneath which uh, najasa and dirt would, uh, or the janaba and the dirt would gather. Um, so they say that this shows that the person should have clean nails. But as we said, first of all, it's a weak hadith. Uh, it was narrated by Abu Dawood at Tayalisi, um, uh, and it's Mursal anyway. So because this person didn't meet the Prophet ﷺ, um, so there's this, plus the fact that all it does is mention that the person should have clean and tidy nails. So it doesn't mention anything about it having to be removed. They also use, um, they say the, the, the famous hadith um, in which uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, ma yuribuk ila ma la yuribuk, or leave that which um, uh, gives you doubt for that which doesn't give you doubt. So they mention a story that came along with this. So they say that uh, Wabi Sah ibn Ma'bad came to the Prophet وسلم, and he said, uh, or he asked him, or he said, Sa'altu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam an kulli shay hatta sa'altuhu an al wasikh al ladhi yakuna fil adfar. Uh, or that I asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about everything, even to the point where I asked him about the dirt that would be under the nails. 
So then the Prophet ﷺ replied with that, or da'ma yuribuk ila ma la yuribuk, or leave that which gives you doubt to that which doesn't give you doubt. Um, however, this is a weak hadith with this whole story. So the statement of the Prophet ﷺ is, is authentic, but it has nothing to do with a story about someone asking about the nails of the Prophet ﷺ. Um, the, um, uh, yeah, so in, in any case, it contains uh, Talha ibn Zayd, who was Munkar al Hadith, or his hadith were rejected by Abu Hatim al Razi and al Bukhari and Nasa'i and others. And then they also say that there's a good possibility that the person would have najasa under his nails, so he should have to remove it before he performs wudu. Um, the next opinion is that it doesn't have to be removed. So they say that if there's anything under the nails, it doesn't have to be removed. And that was the opinion of Imam Ibn Qudama from the Hanabila and Al-Ghazali from the Shafi'iyyah. And what they say is that it's almost unavoidable to get dirt under your nails or to not get dirt under your nails. And it would be a hardship to remove. And then they also say that it's not obligatory to wash under the nails because uh, there's nothing that says anything about under the nails. And the Prophet Wasallam, you know, the number of, of Sahaba that there were, particularly those who were Bedouins and who worked as farmers and worked in, in, in jobs where it was very highly likely that they would uh, have this dirt under their nails. Why did the Prophet Wasallam never say uh, anything about this? Um, so this is uh, the, um, the second opinion. The third opinion is they say that if it's a large amount to the point where it would stop things from, or water from getting there, or a lot of water, it, would be, uh, excuse, or it, w- it wouldn't be excused, and if it's a small amount, it would be excused. And that's the opinion of the Malikiyah, and Ibn Daqiq al-Eid, and Ibn Taymiyyah, uh, and others. So they say that small amounts are forgiven, large amounts aren't. Um... And what they use for this is they say, uh, the hadith, I think we talked about it before or a long time ago, the hadith about when uh, some of the women would ask the Prophet ﷺ about the menstrual blood that would reach their clothing. Um, uh, so for particularly from Aisha radiallahu anha that she said, مَا كَانَ لِإِحْدَانَ إِلَّا ثَوْبٌ وَاحِدٌ تَحِيضُ فِيهِ فَإِذَا صَابَهُ شَيْءٌ مِنْ دَمْ قَالَتْ بِرِيقِهَا فَصَعِقَتْهُ uh, or that Al-Bukhari narrated from Aisha radiallahu anha that she said, some of us would only have one piece of clothing in which she would uh, have her menstruation. So if some of the blood touched their clothing, then she would take some of her, her spit or her saliva and rub it on it um, or scrape it with her fingers. So they say that this is because a small amount would have touched it, um, and then the uh, the spit and scratching it wouldn't wouldn't remove everything. So they say that this shows that small amounts remaining are fine. Large amounts would have to be removed because we know that you'd have to. Wa- There's other hadith that show that you have to wash the najasa from your clothing. But here, if a small amount touched it, then it would be excused. Uh, and Allahu the, Alam, the second opinion that it doesn't have to be removed is the strongest because. There's no evidence that we have to wash underneath the nails. We have to wash the hand. So if the uh, water gets the outside of the hand and the top of the nail and the, and the tip of the finger, then this is sufficient. As for taking the efforts to wash under your nails, there's no evidence for this. And we know that the way the nails of the fingers and the toes are, if, uh, if they're a little bit long, then water wouldn't necessarily always reach under them anyway. You'd have to you know, take your, your other nail and push water underneath. So really there's no evidence to say that it has to be washed. So if, there, if it's dirty, it wouldn't affect anything. The only thing would be if it's on the outside of the hand or on the fingers or elsewhere, then it would have to be removed. The next thing that the author says is people with unusual circumstances, people who cannot control their urine, uh, people with flatulence and so on, and he includes uh, people with or uh, women with uh, prolonged blood flow should perform uh, one wudu for each prayer whether their problem exists all or part of the time their prayers will be acceptable even while their problems are occurring um, so this re- refers to uh, what they say someone who has like a urinary problem or flatulence where they can't stop passing gas or a woman who has prolonged blood flow um, where um, you know it's, it's not their menstruation but they're, they, they're continuously bleeding so really, these things aren't the same. So the reason for this is, we know that 
passing or urinating nullifies the wudu. We all, we also know that um, passing gas nullifies the wudu. However, bleeding itself, if it's not menstrual blood, it doesn't nullify the wudu. Uh, so they're two separate things. Um, so if what we should say to this is that if the person has a continuous something that nullifies the wudu, whether it's urine, urination or if it's uh, or uh, passing gas, if it if it's something that they can't stop, then they would perform wudu for the one time for their for their uh, for for their salat. So they would they would be upon wudu. Then after that, they would um, remain upon wudu as long as they didn't do something else that would nullify their wudu. So what does this mean? Let's say, for example, someone has what they call an Arabi salasul baul, or that the, there's always drops of urine coming out of them where they can't stop it. In this situation, the person would make wudu, and then as long as that is the only urine that comes out, that it's not that they went to the washroom to urinate, it's just it's that continuous uh, you know, drips that are coming out that they can't control, they would, they would stay upon their wudu, whether it's one salat, two salat, five salat, because this is something that we, we over, we're overlooking it now because they can't control it. However, if they were someone who had this problem of, uh, you know, uh, they can't control their urine, and then they, also, then they went to actually relieve themselves, at this point we would say they have to make a new wudu. Because now they did something that's, it's the norm, it's the regular way that a person would nullify their wudu. Um, so this would be the case. So that's, uh, you know, what to add about the... Uh, uh, you know, people with unusual circumstances. And then with regards to um, the prolonged blood flow, um, there's a number of opinions on this. So one is that the person would have to make wudu for every salat, or that the woman would have to make wudu for every salat if they're, if they're having this comp- continuous bleeding. Um, another opinion, or that's the opinion of the Ahnaf and the Hanabila. The uh, second opinion is that the... Obligatory salat, you'd have to make wudu for it, and the sunnah can be prayed with that same wudu. So, meaning that every salat time would have, or each salat would have to, if you made wudu for, for fajr, then you could pray the sunnah of fajr with that salat. If you made wudu for dhuhr, you could pray the fard and the sunnah with that, and same with asr and maghrib and isha. And that's the opinion of the Shafi'iyyah. Um, and what they use for this is they say that. Uh, or they mentioned the hadith from Aisha radiallahu anha that she said, Jat Fatima to Bintu Abi Hubaish il Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Fakalat Ya Rasulullah, Indiam Ratun Ustahalu Fala Atahur, Afa Ada as Salat, or that Fatima bint Abi Hubaish came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and she said, I'm a woman who has prolonged blood flow. So should I leave the Salat? Like, should I never pray again? So uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, لا إنما ذلك عرق وليس بحيضة أو بحيض فإذا أقبلت حيضتك فدعي الصلاة وإذا أدبرت فغسلي عنك الدم ثم صلي. Or that the Prophet ﷺ said, no, so don't leave your salat. That's only uh, a blood vessel and it's not menstruation. So if your menstruation begins, then leave the salat, and if it leaves or, or goes away then uh, wash the blood off of you and perform your salat. Then one of the sub-narrators said, قَالَ uh, أَبِي ثُمَّ تَوَضِّئِي لِكُلِّ صَلَاةِ حَتَّى يَجِئُ ذَلِكَ الْوَقْتِ Or uh, one of the narrators said that my father said then she should perform wudu um, for every salat until the next time of, or the time of the next salat comes. Um, and that's agreed upon and... Uh, a uh, Muslim didn't mention anything about the wudu. So what they say here is that the Prophet ﷺ had this woman ask him about prolonged blood flow. So he said uh, that after the menstruation, she should perform her ghusl and then or she should wash the blood off of her. And then this other narrator said, and she should perform wudu for every salat. Um, so they say that this is the evidence. And then they mention some other ahadith um, that are weak, so we don't need to, to go into them. But... Uh, this is the most authentic thing on this topic. Um, however, as you saw, like I said, the Prophet ﷺ said that she should do this, and then another narrator said, and she should perform the wudu for every salat. So really, 
it's not from the Prophet ﷺ that he said the, that the wudu should be performed for every salat. All he said is that you, that they would wash the blood off of them. Um, so this is uh, it's actually it's a what they call a, a, a mudraj narration or it's a mudraj phrasing. So meaning that one of the sub narrators said something and later on people started to add it to the hadith, uh, thinking that it was from the statement of the Prophet ﷺ, When in reality, it wasn't from the Prophet ﷺ. Um, Others say that it's mustahab to perform wudu in this situation, and those are the Malikiyah. And uh, Ibn Hazm, rahimahullah, said that it's obligatory for every salat. So meaning that if it's a, if it's if they perform the sunnah of fajr, they make wudu, then they have to make wudu again to to perform the fard of fajr. And every every rak'ah or every two rak'ahs that they're praying, every set, they would have to make wudu. Allahu alam. The strongest opinion is that. They don't have to make wudu at all. It doesn't matter how many salat they pray. It doesn't matter uh, whether it's a sunnah or fard. It doesn't matter if they do it before the time or after the time because there's no evidence from the Quran or the sunnah that bleeding, even if it's from the private area, <coughs> nullifies the wudu. Um, we have evidence for urination, we have evidence for defecation, we have evidence for passing gas, we have evidence for eating camel's meat, we have evidence for touching the pro- for a man touching his private area. We have no evidence to say that bleeding from the private area um, nullifies the wudu. So Allahu alam, that would be the strongest opinion. So the closest is that of the Malikiya, that they say it would be recommended, just because, and like it's recommended for every, every salat to perform wudu. Next, the author says, one may be assisted by others in performing wudu. So he can have help if someone wants to help him. Um, and, uh, you know, and then it, for whatever reason is. And so there's a number of situations where someone would get help by um, when they were performing wudu. So the first situation is that the person can't perform wudu without the other person's help. So meaning, for whatever reason, they can't move their arms or legs they can't get the water in some way except if someone else helps them. Um, in this case, there's a consensus that um, uh, it's, it's, it, they can get help from them. So meaning that if, if, you, if the only way you can perform wudu is if you ask someone else for help, then this would be uh, permissible um, by uh, that uh, if, 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 if there isn't a jama'ah, then at least the vast majority of people say that you're allowed to. And they use the rule that... Um, that مَا لَا يَتِمُّ الْوَاجِبُ إِلَّا بِهِ فَهُوَ wajib Or anything that is needed in order for something obligatory to be performed, then that thing becomes obligatory. So if a person has to perform wudu, and he can get someone else to help him, and if he doesn't get that person to help him, he won't be able to perform wudu, at this point he would have to do so, and it would be allowed for him to do so. Um, another situation is that if you get someone to bring water for you, so this is also allowed because there's many narrations where the Prophet ﷺ would have asked someone to bring him water or people would bring him water on their own uh, for the ajr in order to help the Prophet ﷺ. So this is something that's permissible as well. Another situation where you would get help for wudu is having someone um, pour the water for you. So they don't just get the water, you, they're actually, they have a container or something and they pour the water for you uh, to make wudu. Um, uh, there's a difference of opinion on whether this is uh, permissible or not. Uh, the Ahnaf and some of the Shafi'iya say it's makruh. So a person should avoid having someone pour water for them when there's no need to. Um, and then the, uh, the uh, Maliki and the uh, Hanabila um, say that it's fine. And some say um, that it's better not to. So really in reality they differ. None of them say it's haram. Some say that it's fine. Some say... It's disliked, and some say it's just better not to do so. Allahu alam. In that situation, it would be fine because there's no, there's nothing to to show that you can't do that. Um, so again, we stick to the rule that we always use that everything is permissible until proven otherwise, or nothing's haram or makruh or uh, obligatory or recommended until we have an evidence from the Quran um, or the Sunnah. And another situation that the scholars mention is that you actually have someone perform the wudu for you. So if you're sitting there and they pour the water and rub it on your arms or they rub it on your face or your feet or they wipe your head, um, so they're actually doing it for you. Um, uh, this, the, the, the Ahnaf and the Shafi'iyah say it's, it's disliked and the Malikiyah say it's haram. What they say for this is now you're not even performing the wudu really, someone's doing it for you and you're seeking help for something that you don't need to seek help for. 
Um, uh, so they say that uh, uh, this is the situation. However, um, some have said that it's allowed. Allahu alam, it would at the very least it would be disliked. So you shouldn't get someone to perform your wudu for you. Like if there's no reason, um, because you're asking for help for something that you don't need, and you're not actually you're not actually performing this action um, any on your own anymore. Um, and then there's a number of hadith about seeking help um, when uh, uh, performing wudu that would fall under these categories, but um, many of them we've mentioned before, so there's no reason to, uh, uh, to, to go into it. The last point that the author mentions is one may use a towel to dry himself during any time of the year. So the reason he mentions this is because there is a difference of opinion about what's the ruling on drying yourself after you perform wudu. Um, and does it apply to the whole year round, or is it just in, like is summer different than winter? Is ghusl different than wudu? Um, in reality, there's many opinions on this. There's about seven opinions on this topic. Inshallah, we won't go into all of them. Um, it's conf- what's confirmed is from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he performed ghusl that his wife, uh, radiallahu anha, came and brought him something to dry himself with, and he refused it. Um, that's all that's authentic from the Prophet Sallallahu with regards to any sort of tahara. Um, so we see from this, he didn't do it, but he also, he didn't forbid it, and he didn't say, I'm not, I'm not uh, taking it due to, um, uh, you know, uh, due to any sort of ibadah. It was just his preference. And then also, the only other thing that we have authentic on this is a narration from Abdullah ibn Abbas, with regards to um, ghusl and wudu, and that he differentiated between um, ghusl and wudu. So Allahu Alam on this whole topic, we would say that it's permissible to dry yourself from wudu or from ghusl. It's not recommended and it's not disliked. It doesn't matter whether it's cold or whether it's hot. Uh, it doesn't matter um, you know, what the situation is. It's, it's up to you. So since there's nothing authentic on it, again, we say that despite the fact that there's seven different opinions on the topic, it really doesn't matter because really there's no uh, evidence to prove otherwise. So that's the end of the chapters of Wulu. Um, next, we'll go into wiping upon the Hufayn. Um, but I guess before we go into that, uh, if there's any questions on issues of Wulu. For like including like Fard and yeah. uh, Ibn Hazm. And uh, just for the Fard, but not for the not for the Salah. Just for the the uh, Hanabila, the Ahnaf and the Hanabila. And uh, the opinion where it's just, you just perform wudu normally for any Salah when you need to make it, you do it. The Malikia. Yeah. Because with those are the three opinions, right? There and there's some that said it's for every salat, but you'd include the sunnah with that salat. So meaning, like if you performed wudu for fajr, then you'd pray the sunnah and the fard. If you prayed it for, if you made it for dhuhr, it would include all six sunnah rak'ahs or maybe eight, depending on what you did, and the four fard. So it's more for it's more for the time as opposed to the uh, each each set of of salat. Okay, and uh, yeah. who takes that opinion? Shafi'iyah. That's it. Okay, so next is uh, it, wiping upon the khuf. Um So it doesn't say that in the book, it just says proof of its legitimacy. But So it's talking about wiping upon the khuf. So the author says, wiping over the socks. So he, they tr- the translation in English, they just say socks for everything, but we have to differentiate between them because there is a difference of opinion. He says, wiping upon the socks is part of the sunnah. And Nawawi states, all of those who qualify for ijma' agree that it is allowed to wipe over the socks during traveling or at home, if needed or not. Even a woman who stays at home or a handicapped person who cannot walk can do so. The Shia and the Khawarij reject it, but their rejection is not valid. Uh, and then he says, Ibn Hajj, or then the author says, Ibn Hajar says in Fath al-Bari, all the Hufal of Hadith are of the opinion uh, that wiping over the Khuf has come through the continuous transmi- transmission. So he's referring to Mutawatir. So he's saying that the number of ahadith that have come on wiping over the khuf are too many to be rejected by anybody, um, and they're so authentic that essentially all the scholars of hadith have agreed that it's authentic from the Prophet ﷺ to wipe over uh, the khuf. 
then he says some have collected all of its narrations um, uh, and it, its number exceeds 80. So meaning over 80 Sahaba narrated from the Prophet Sallallahu that he would wipe over the khuf. And he says this includes hadith from the 10 people who were promised Jannah. So the Al-Ashr al-Mubashireen bil Jannah. Um, so the hadith, the long hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu said, Abu Bakr fil Jannah wa Umar fil Jannah until the end of the 10. So meaning that the number of a hadith that have come on this, it's reached 80 Sahaba. And that includes a hadith from Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali and Abu Ubaid ibn al-Jarrah and Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas to all of those ten from the uh, people who were promised Jannah. Then he says the strongest hadith on this point has been related by Ahmad al-Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawood and al-Tirmidhi from, uh, on the authority of Hammam and Nakhai who said, Bala jarirun thumma tawadda wa masaha ala khuffayhi faqeel taf'alu hadha or Hammam said that Jarir radiallahu anhu uh, urinated and then he performed wudu and he wiped on his khuf. So people said to him, do you do this? Um, like they were questioning it. So he said, Naam, ra'aytu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam bala thumma tawadda wa masaha ala khuffayh. Or he said, yes, I saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam urinate, then he performed wudu and he wiped upon his khuf. And then it continues and it says, قَالَ الْأَعْمَشْ قَالَ Ibrahim or Al-A'mash said that Ibrahim said, so Ibrahim al nakhai who was from the Tabi'een, that he said, كَانَ يُعْجِبُهُمْ هَذَا الْحَدِيثِ لِأَنَّ إِسْلَامَ جَرِيرٌ أو جَرِيرٍ كَانَ بَعْدَ نُزُولَ الْمَائِدَةِ Or they said, they used to be impressed by this hadith because Islam, or sorry, Jarir entered Islam after uh, Surah Al-Ma'idah was revealed. So what's the significance of this? What does it matter when this person entered Islam? Yeah, so in Surah Al-Ma'idah, this is the verse that Allah SWT told us how to make wudu. So for example, if, if they saw Jarir doing this, and then if he had entered Islam before Surah Al-Ma'idah was revealed, Someone could say, well, he saw the Prophet ﷺ do this before Surah Al-Ma'idah, and maybe he's unaware of the ayah or something like this. But the fact that he didn't even become Muslim until, until after that verse was revealed, and so he he's clearly only saw the Prophet ﷺ wiping over his khuf after the ayah of wudu was revealed. So this shows that it was something that there, there's, no, there's no abrogation of it. it, it still remains, it's, no one can say, well, this was before, and then Allah SWT told us to wash our feet. It's clear that the Prophet ﷺ did this before this uh, verse was revealed. Did you have a question? Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, this and this hadith is obviously authentic. It's narrated by uh, Al Bukhari and Muslim, as well as Abu Dawood, Al Tirmidhi, and Ahmad. Then he says one of its verses calls for washing one's feet. This hadith helps us understand the verse by confining it to those to, to one who is not wearing socks. This constitutes a particular case and the person who wears uh, socks can just wipe over them. So he's saying that this hadith shows us that uh, the, the verse about washing the feet isn't absolute. It isn't all the time that you have to wash your feet, that there's an exception to the rule. And it shows that it's if you're wearing something on your foot, then you can wipe over it. And then we'll talk about the other conditions for that. So, you know, there's other conditions about what makes it valid to wipe over it or not. And just to add a bit to this, um, this issue of wiping over the khuf was so important amongst the salaf that they would actually, even though it's a fiqh issue, it's related to ma- making wudu and, and things like this, but many of them would include it in their books of aqidah. So they would say that it's from our aqidah that we wipe upon the khuf. As far back as Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. So it's narrated from Abu Hanifa that he said, al-mas'hu ala khuffayni sunnah, or that. Wiping upon the khuf fain is from the sunnah. And that's from his book, Al-Fiqh Al-Akbar. And also, um, there's a narration from Sufyan Al-Thawri uh, that he said, uh, Ya Shu'ayb, so he was talking to Shu'ayb ibn Harb, who's from his companions, لا ينفعك ما كتبت لك حتى ترى المسح على الخفين دون خلعهما أعدل عندك من غسل القدمين. Or that... Uh, Sufyan al-Thawri who was from the early scholars he died uh, in the year 261 um, that he said if uh, actually no that, that, so he said that 
he had told one of his companions the aqidah of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. So he ta- ta- taught him what he believed to be the correct aqidah, and then he said, O Shu'ayb ibn Harb, none of this will benefit you. So all the things I've told you, won't be- it'll, won't benefit you at all until you see that, or until you hold the opinion that wiping on the khuf is better than um, removing them and then washing your feet. Or that it's it's more it's that you'd rather wipe upon them instead of removing it to wash your feet, um, and that's from Sharh Usul Atiqad Ahl Sunnah Wal Jama'ah by Imam Al Lalakai. So this shows that they, they they considered it so important that they would con- include it in their books of Aqidah. and the reason for that is, as we saw from the author, what he said was that the the Shia, particularly the Rafida, and then the Khawarij, they rejected this. So they said you can't wipe on the khuf, you have to wash your feet. Um, so the uh, the scholars of Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah, the early ones, would see well, groups of bid'ah have rejected this. So and they've rejected it because of a bid'ah. So despite the fact that it's confirmed from the Prophet Sallallahu that he wiped on his his khuf, and the Sahaba would do it during his lifetime, and the Sahaba did it afterwards, and the Tabi'een did it in the time of the Sahaba, and the Prophet Sallallahu told the Sahaba to do so, despite all of this, they say, well no, you can't do it. So, the, the scholars of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah would see, well, it's, this, it's important to the point where it needs to be included in our books of Aqidah, even though it has not... Uh, the books of Aqidah don't mention anything particular about, uh, you know, you have to raise your hands in certain parts of the Salat, or you have to put your hands on your chest or your stomach. They don't, they don't discuss these things because it's not an issue of Aqidah. But these groups of Bid'ah, particularly the Rafidah and the Khawarij, took it so far that they rejected it, so our ulama found it needed, or that it was needed to be placed in um, our books of Aqidah. And there's many uh, other books of Aqidah that mention it. Uh, uh, Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari mentioned it in um, his book uh, 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 Al-Ibana Ibn Batta also mentioned it in Al-Ibana and Al-Tahawi mentioned it in his Aqidah uh, so Al-Aqidah Al-Tahawiyah it's mentioned in there um, so many many ulama mentioned it in their books of Aqidah um, so just to add a bit to this as well so um, with regards to Ahl Sunnah Wal Jama'ah so if we're talking about not groups of Bid'ah all of them have agreed upon the permissibility of wiping upon the khufain. The only difference of opinion that's narrated is from Imam Malik. So there's three opinions from Imam Malik that have been narrated from him. The first is that you can wipe on the khufain, just like everybody else says. The second is that he said you can only do it while you're traveling. And the third is that he said you can't do it at all. Um, however, if we look at what the Maliki scholars and his companions in particular they said, no, what's confirmed from Imam Malik and what's the strongest from him is the same as Imam Abu Hanifa and, and, and uh, Shafi'i and uh, Dawood ibn Ali and Imam Ahmed and all of the other scholars of fiqh of Ahl sunnah wal Jama'ah that they said that you can wipe upon it whether you're living in your city or whether you're traveling or whether there's a hardship or not a hardship you can wipe upon them. So there's only, some have said that you know, it's, it's restricted to traveling and some have said no. Um, so the ones who say that it's only, and we'll finish with this point, the ones who say that it's permissible all the time, they use the hadith from the Prophet ﷺ that, that the author mentioned, and we'll get into more next week. So it's confirmed from the Prophet ﷺ that he did so while he was traveling and while he wasn't, and he gave even specific rulings to differentiate. So if you're traveling, you have up to three days, and if you're a resident at home, then you have one day. So obviously, it's permissible in both. The ones who restrict it to traveling, what they say is they mention a hadith from Shuraih ibn Hanit that he said, Ataytu Aisha as'aluha an al al khuffain, or that I came to Aisha to ask her about uh, wiping upon the khuffain. فَقَالَتْ عَلَيْكَ بِأَبْنِ أَبِي طَالِبْ فَإِنَّهُ كَانَ يُسَافِرُ مَعَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ So she said, go to, Ab- to Ibn Abi Talib. So go to Ali رضي الله عنه because he used to travel with the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. So meaning that he was with him while he was traveling and while he was in Al-Madina. Um, so he would have more knowledge on the topic. Uh, so uh, the, the Shuraih said, فَسَأَلْنَاهُ فَقَالَ جَعَلَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ ثَلَاثَةَ أَيَّامٍ وَلَيَالِيَهُنَّ لِلْمُسَافِرْ وَيَوْمًا وَلَيْلَةً لِلْمُقِيمِ Or that, um, so, so Shuraih said, so we asked Ali, and he said, the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم gave three days and nights for the traveler, 
and one day and night for uh, the person who's a resident, so someone who isn't traveling. Uh, and that hadith is narrated by Muslim. So what do they get out of this? How do they use this hadith to prove that it's um, only for traveling? Any idea? So they say when, when uh, Shuraih went to Aisha, she said, عَلَيْكَ بِأَبْنِ أَبِي طَالِبْ فَإِنَّهُ كَانُ يُسَافِرُ مَعَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ Or that, go to Ali ibn Abi Talib because he used to travel with the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. So they say, well this proves that it's only done in, in traveling. What's the, what's the rejection? How do we um, answer against this? In the hadith itself, there's evidence. That uh, it's, you can wipe over for one day if you're a resident? Right, so they've, they only took the first part of the hadith. Mm. The question. No, didn't think that. But when they went, when Shuraih went to Ali, he told him, "Well, for the traveler has three days and nights, so right, so the proofs of traveling." And he said, "And the one who's who's living, or he's a resident, he has a day and a night. So, who cares if Aisha said um, that, that ask Ali radiallahu anhu because he used to travel? There's no evidence. Even so, the fact that she's saying she didn't know, she didn't know that he would do it or not." But Ali, when he answered, he said, well, he would, this is the amount of time. So Ali didn't even restrict it to traveling or, or, or um, the, reject it in that sense. Also, they use a hadith from Ibn Abbas uh, that he said, Inna inda Umar hina ikhtasama ilayhi Sa'adun wa ibn Umar fil mashi ala al-khuffayn faqadha li Sa'ad. Faqultu, law qultum bihada fil safar al-ba'id الشديد, or that Ibn Abbas, uh, he said, I was at Umar's house when Sa'ad, so Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas and Ibn Umar, so Umar ibn Khattab's son, the two of them went to the to Umar to have him judge between them about wiping upon the Khuffain. So he says he judged for Sa'ad. So Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas was saying, yes, you can wipe on the Khuff. Ibn Umar at the time was saying, no, you can't. So they went to Umar ibn Khattab because he was uh, obviously more knowledgeable than both of them. And he judged that Sa'ad was correct. So Ibn Abbas said, if only you had restricted this to someone who's traveling far and someone, or in times when, the, um, uh, when it's very, uh, very cold. So they say that this proves that Ibn Abbas didn't, didn't hold it permissible to wipe upon the hoof while the person was... Um, in t- like in his city, but it was only allowed when he was traveling. So they use this, and this is narrated by Al-Bayhaqi um, uh, and others. The ones who say that it's not allowed at all, they use a hadith from Aisha radiallahu anha, or Al-Qasim, Ibn Muhammad said, قالت عائشة لأن أخرجهما بالسكاكين أحب إلي من, أم- من أن أمسح عليهما or that Aisha radiallahu anha said, if I, was, if I needed to cut them out with knives, so meaning if I had to cut my feet out of my khufain with knives, I'd rather do that than wipe upon them. Um, and that's narrated by uh, Ibn Abi Shayba in Al-Musannaf, and it's authentic from her. So they say Aisha rejected wiping upon the khufain. So how can we accept it? Um, and then they also use a hadith from Ibn Abbas where he um, said that the Prophet ﷺ would only wipe upon the khuf before Surah Al-Ma'idah was revealed. Um, so there's two issues to mention here. First of all, if we have a statement from the Prophet ﷺ that's clear, and then we have something from a Sahabi that contradicts it, what, which one do we take? The Prophet ﷺ. No matter how much we love that Sahabi, if it's Abu Bakr or Umar or Uthman or Ali or Aisha or any of the Ummahat al Mu'minin, as much as we love them and as much as we have allegiance and wala for them, we only love them because of their following the Prophet ﷺ and their their assisting the Prophet ﷺ. And we know that they're human beings, and we know that they disputed, so the, and we know that they're not uh, infallible, or that they're not protected from mistakes. So if we happen to have a statement from a companion, whether it's on this issue or anything, we say, is their statement or opinion supported by the Qur'an and Sunnah? If it is, then we follow it. If it contradicts it, then we say, this was their own ijtihad or their own uh, you know, judgment, and we follow the Qur'an and the Sunnah. And then about the one from Ibn Abbas, first of all, it's weak. Second, we know the Prophet ﷺ wiped on the Khufayn after 
Surah Al-Ma'idah because of the hadith of, of Jarir, which was narrated by Al-Bukhari and Muslim and others. Um, and it also it's narrated from Ibn Abbas with an authentic chain that he said, يَمْسَحُ الْمُسَافِرُ عَلَى الْخُفَّيْنِ ثَلَاثَةَ أَيَّامٍ بِلَيَالِيَهُنْ وَلَلْمُقِيمِ يَوْمًا وَلَيْلًا Or that Ibn Abbas said, the traveler can wipe upon his khuf for three days and nights, and the resident for a day and a night. And that's narrated by Ibn Abi Shayba, and it's, it's sahih. Um, and then the last thing uh, that they try to use is they, they mention a narration from uh, Abu Hurairah, radiallahu anhu, um, which uh, there's a dispute about its authenticity, but he said, or it's attributed to him that he said, "Ma ubali ala zahri khuffi masahtu, aw ala zahri himar," or that it doesn't matter to me, or there's no difference in my opinion if I was to wipe upon my khuff or if I was to wipe upon the back of a donkey. So meaning that there's no, it doesn't matter. This doesn't affect my wudu, and this doesn't affect my wudu. And Allahu alam, there's contradictory narrations from Abu Huraira. Um, radiallahu anhu about this topic so what we take away from this is that wiping upon the khuf is agreed upon from Ahl sunnah wal jama'ah particularly the older scholars or the earlier scholars later on some dispute came um, some of the lahiriya disputed it uh, particularly Imam Dawood's son um, Abu Bakr however we disregard this and we say it, it's contradictory or it goes against the ijma'ah the Khawarij and the Shia, particularly the Rafidah, rejected it, but we don't take their opinion into account because at the very least they're on bid'ah and some of them would have reached kufr depending on wh- who we're talking about. So we don't take them into account when we're talking about uh, ijma or the ahkam of the Muslimin. And we say that wiping upon the khuf is permissible and it's definitely from the sunnah. It's confirmed from the Prophet wasallam and the Sahaba during his lifetime and the Sahaba after his lifetime. Um, so inshallah we'll stop there next week we'll talk about wiping upon socks so meaning when we talk about the khuf we're talking about the leather socks that people wear next week we'll get into actual uh, cloth socks and other things inshallah we'll stop there Wallahu alam.